the Trump legal team has come up with an interesting, creative approach to how to prevent the electors from electing Biden as president of the United States and turning the presidency over to him. Will it work? You'll hear my analysis on the Der Show. You'll also hear my analysis of the conflict I and others are having over the election to the Senate of the Reverend Warnick, who is a Democrat, but who has expressed strong anti-Israel views. These and other issues on The Dare Show. The Wall Street Journal has an intriguing article entitled, What is Trump's Legal Strategy? Try to Block Certification of Biden Victory in States. Look, I have no objection to any candidate pursuing every possible legal and constitutional remedy. And I applaud Trump's lawyers for being creative and looking to the text of the Constitution, looking to the laws of various states in order to exhaust every possible legal remedy before conceding. That's their right. Is it the right thing to do? I leave that to viewers and, and listeners. That's a political judgment. But legally, they certainly are entitled to pursue every remedy. Now, what, what do they have in mind? Uh, let, me, let me explain what the Constitution provides and then talk about an historical precedent that I'm sure the Trump people are thinking about. Constitutionally, under the 12th Amendment to the Constitution, which was enacted after the fiasco involving Jefferson and Burr and Hamilton, which we all know about from the musical Hamilton, where neither candidate uh, got a majority because Burr uh, decided to undo the deal he had made with Jefferson. Once that happened, everybody needed to amend the Constitution, and the Constitution was amended. And it now provides that the electors shall meet uh, in their respective states and certify the votes, who won the popular vote and who will be the electors. Uh, the electors then send their votes on to the president of the Senate. Now, that's significant because, of course, the president of the Senate currently, until January 3rd, is a Republican. That conceivably could change after January 3rd, but the Constitution doesn't provide explicitly which date the certification must occur, by the old Senate or the new Senate. So that's constitutional question number one. The president of the Senate, then in the presence of the entire Senate and the House of Representatives, opens up the certifications and looks to see if either candidate has re received a majority of the electors. If a candidate has received a majority of the certified electors, he is then declared to be the president-elect of the United States to be sworn in on January 20th. If neither candidate receives a majority, the matter goes automatically to the House of Representatives, but not to the House of Representatives if we know it. We know the House of Representatives is having hundreds and hundreds of people meeting in this big, enormous hall, and every member of the House casts his own or her own vote, and many states are divided. Uh, California, you know, you have lots and lots of representatives, most of whom are Democrats, some of whom are Republican. That's true of almost every state. They don't, however, vote for president individually by member of the House. They vote state by state. Every state gets one vote. How is the vote of that state determined? It's determined by a majority of the representatives from that state. So let's take, for example, a state like Pennsylvania. The electoral vote for Pennsylvania might very well go to Biden because he, at least according to current count, won the popular vote in the state of Pennsylvania. But let's assume there are more Republican representatives from Pennsylvania than there are Democrat representatives. In that case, the Pennsylvania vote goes to Trump. 
goes to the Republican, even though the electoral vote, the vote of the popular to elect electors, went in favor of the other candidates. Very confusing, but it's also very clear under the Constitution. There's no ambiguity about it. The Constitution says every state gets to cast one vote. So one of the approaches that the Trump legal team is seeking to explore at least whether they've come down on it or opted on it, the Wall Street Journal article doesn't say, they just say they're exploring it, is to try to get enough challenges in enough states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada, um, uh, uh, Georgia, um, Arizona, and get enough state secretaries of state or governors, whoever under the state law does it, to refuse to certify as the victor um, former Vice President Biden. The hope then is that there won't be enough electoral votes, 270, to elect him president. If he gets 269 and Trump gets 230, um, the case then goes to the House, where this mechanism of state-by-state -state voting operates. So that seems to be the approach that's being explored, at least, by the Trump team. Can it succeed? It requires a perfect storm for it to work. It requires that there are sufficient challenges that the courts take seriously in order to either stop the counting or refuse to certify a particular winner. It requires that the numbers be enough to change the elector and the electoral votes in at least three or four states. One state won't do it, and two states, depending on which two states they are. But it is theoretically, theoretically possible that when the matter comes before the president of the Senate and both houses of Congress, that conceivably there won't be 270 votes for one candidate. If that were the case, then the matter goes to the House, and the House would probably declare Trump to be the president. Possibly. You never know. Uh, everything's up in the air. Again, the issue is, is it the old House, the new House, the old Senate, the new Senate? Those issues are not clearly laid out in the Constitution of the United States. And of course, since we have right now a divided Congress, House of Representatives under the control of the Democrats, Senate under the control of the Republicans, we're not going to get a definitive resolution of that issue by congressional action. So it could end up being a little bit like the infamous election of 1824. Let me go back in history now and remind you a little bit about that election. Two candidates uh, were the leading candidates. Uh, Andrew Jackson, who was the hero of the War of 1812 and famous for his uh, a a attack on Native Americans, and uh, generally a popular figure, running against an establishment figure, namely John Quincy Adams. You couldn't be more establishment than that. His father was president of the United States, the second president, one of the authors of the Declaration of Independence, came from the prominent Massachusetts Adams uh, family. But they were not the only two candidates running, Jackson versus Adams. If they had been the only two, we wouldn't have gotten into the issue we got into. Clay was also running who was the um, pr prominent person in the House of Representatives, um, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, if I'm not mistaken. He was running, too, and two other candidates were running. And when the electoral votes were finally counted, Andrew Jackson got many more votes than any of the other candidates, but he didn't get a majority because of the presence of other candidates. This was before the two-party system were established, and... Nobody ran in 1824 as a Federalist. They all ran as kind of Democrats. So the uh, matter went to the House of Representatives. And in the House of Representatives, a deal was made between Henry Clay, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, the dominant force in the House, the candidate who ran against him and finished third in the balloting. A deal was made between Clay and Adams and uh, the House of Representatives declared uh, Adams to be the president, even though he lost the popular vote and got fewer electoral votes. 
Jackson supporters immediately claimed that it was a corrupt bargain. And from the day of that election, Jackson and his followers decided to campaign on that corrupt bargain to run again four years later. And it was successful. For four years, the Jacksonians railed against Adams, called his presidency illegitimate, said the election was stolen from him. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? So if the Trump legal team and political team follows the playbook of the 1824 and 1828 elections, what can we anticipate? Uh, we can anticipate a fight, an argument, uh, a refusal to concede, uh, an attempt to get the states not to certify, and in the end, if Biden is declared the winner, a refusal to accept that and a campaign for the next four years for a, for a redo, for a do-over. And am I saying that's going to happen? No. Uh, in fact, probably it won't. But according to the Wall Street Journal article and a report by some insiders close to the Trump team, it's on the agenda as a possible approach. Um, will President Trump announce that he is going to seek re-election in four years? Will he spend the next four years railing against the unfair results? I think it depends on the recounts that occur, the lawsuits that are taking place. If it turns out there is no real evidence of corruption, no real evidence of uh, any kind of uh, false voting or any kind of distorted voting, if it turns out this is all just based on anecdotal evidence involving a few people but not a massive number, probably that won't work. But if the lawsuits turn up massive uh, voter fraud, which I don't see any evidence of now, but if it were to turn up massive voter fraud and unconstitutional actions by, for example, the Supreme Court of uh, Pennsylvania, then one can imagine the Jackson playbook being followed whether it would be followed successfully or not, nobody would know until 2024. But on the Dirt Show, you're going to hear all the possibilities lay out. I'm not advocating such action. I'm not suggesting it. I'm simply reporting it. I'm telling you that according to the Wall Street Journal, this is a plan that is being considered by at least some people in the Trump campaign. And I'm also laying out for you how it could work legally and constitutionally. It is a real long shot. Uh, it is something that would be disruptive, obviously. If you had four years of a person with 70 million votes uh, talking about the illegitimacy of the president, it would obviously hurt us uh, internationally. It would hurt us domestically. It would continue the divisiveness that we are experiencing in this country. Again, I'm simply reporting the reality. Nobody can dispute those facts. I'm not saying good or bad or indifferent. That's for the voters to decide, for viewers, for listeners to decide. I'm just laying out for you the possibilities. Don't blame me if it happens. I'm not advocating it. I'm not suggesting it. I'm reporting it. And so those are the options that are now being considered. At least it explains something that was harder to understand. Why would the Trump legal team be challenging in a small number of states where the outcomes probably wouldn't determine the election in general? They would have to win quite a few states to reverse the fortunes of President Trump. Well, this explains that maybe they don't have to win that many states to at least create a problem of certification by some states, confusion, so that when the electors meet, there won't be 270. If you ask me to predict the outcome, my prediction is there will be 270. There'll probably be 300 uh, electoral votes for uh, Biden. But he is not the president-elect until that happens. He is the presumed president-elect because the networks have called it in his favor. But he is not yet the president-elect 
until the certification occurs. And the Trump defense team, they've read the Constitution. They've read the laws. They know what the rules are in Michigan. They know what the rules are in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, in Nevada, in Arizona, and in Georgia. And they're going to take advantage of those rules. So be prepared. Be ready. This may not be over. Again, you ask me my opinion. I think it's likely that this will not be carried out. And if it is carried out, won't be carried out successfully. But you never know. I would have said the same thing in 2000. If somebody had asked me, and indeed people did ask me back then, would the Bush Supreme Court approach work? Would the Supreme Court stop the counting? I probably would have said unlikely. And of course, it did happen. And the election was given by the Supreme Court in a five to four partisan vote to um, the then to be president, George W. Bush. Could it happen this time? Unlikely. Possible? Anything's possible. We live in strange times. There's the old curse. May you live in interesting times. We are cursed and we are blessed. The curse is it's divisive. The blessing is it's fascinating. And as I promise you, you'll never be bored by listening to The Dirt Show, not only because I'm not boring, but because what's going on outside is fascinating. Whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it's very interesting. So I really look forward to your calls, your input on this and other issues that we're now facing. And so now we turn to our callers on The Dirt Show. Our first call today on The Dirt Show is from Steve in Texas. I saw a thing on Facebook, and I know that starts the conversation poorly, right? <laughs> but it's a gentleman that goes over some options for President Trump during this challenging portion of the election. And he mentioned 1800 and 1824, where if President Trump does not concede and we get past the point of no return, is that something to the fact that the it would null and void the election and would be then sent to the House of Representatives for a vote, one vote per state, um, and he could still be elected, reelected as president of the United States. I was wondering if, I mean, the guy sounded articulate, you know, and, and again, it, it, it's television, right? So tell a vision. So it, it could be somebody's spin on something. But I was curious, your thought, you're a legal scholar, um, and I trust your opinions. Um, I've watched you when you were on the far left, and I've watched you come to the center and sometimes lean right. And it's in, it's in refreshing to to listen to your radio show and watch you on Twitter and things like that. So I appreciate you. But just curious to see if that's a bunch of BS or that's a possibility that, of course, the left media isn't going to share. Because the, the guy had also mentioned that Hillary Clinton had, had said prior to the election for Joe Biden not to concede no matter what. So I was thinking she probably, as sneaky as she is, she, uh, she had already known about this, too, and I'm sure other people do. So just uh, your thoughts and thoughts and comments on that. Well, thanks for your good question. First, a correction. I've never been on the hard left. Um, I've always been exactly where I am today. I'm a centrist, liberal, civil libertarian. The world has moved around me. So where I am now may look a little different on the political spectrum, but I've never been a hard left. I've always been an opponent of the hard left. I'm very strongly opposed to radicalism, the radical left, uh, anything that uh, smacks of uh, radicalism on the left. But um, um, my positions have stayed the same, but what side they come out on may appear different because of changes in the world. Uh, the person you're referring to is absolutely correct as a matter of constitutional law, theoretically. The uh, election goes to the House of Representatives where each state gets one vote, if a majority of the electors do not cast their vote for a particular candidate, the House then gets to select who the president will be from the top three candidates, which really means in this case the top two candidates, and there's no criteria. They can do it on purely partisan grounds, and if it did go to the House, and if the House delegations uh, favored Republicans, they could conceivably 
select Donald Trump to be president uh, they, in the way they selected John Adams in 1824 uh, and Thomas Jefferson in 1800. Theoretically possible, likely, I don't believe so. Our next call is from Stephen. Um, Professor Dershowitz, you know, I was just listening to you talking about the um, extreme left attempting to take over the Biden campaign's uh, foreign policy or the Biden administration if it comes to that foreign policy. And, um, and you you know, excuse me for saying so because I have the greatest respect for you, but your apparent bewilderment over this. Um, uh, I'm, I'm constantly shocked um, by highly intelligent American Jews like yourself and at Eric Weinstein, for example, who simply refuse to accept that the Democratic Party is an extreme socialist organization now. It is not the Democratic Party of Jack Kennedy or of even of Franklin you know, Roosevelt. You people are the reason why we're at the, at the edge, at the precipice now, because you are the smart good people who could have done changed things and you didn't because you're clinging to some past that no longer exists. I say this with all um, affection and respect, but, you know, wake up. Well, I appreciate your advice to me. Um, I don't think the Democratic Party is socialist or hard left. Uh, indeed, the campaign for who got the nomination was a campaign between Elements of the Democratic Party on the hard left, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders particularly, and the center. And the center was Joe Biden, and the center won. Um, this is not the first time the Democratic Party has been torn apart like this, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, there was an attempt to get him to nominate as his vice president, Henry Wallace, who was a socialist on the left. And he, in fact, instead picked Harry Truman probably knowing that he would not live out his fourth term. And Truman became the president. Had Harry, Henry Wallace become president, I think we would have moved far, far left. So the Democratic Party has, for years, had a struggle between hard left elements and centrist elements. It's much more visible now with the squad, with people like AOC, who were admitted socialists, or Bernie Sanders, uh, who acknowledge socialists. Uh, they claim they're socialists not in the spirit of Castro or Venezuela, but more in the spirit of Northern Europe. I'm not so sure about that. But right now, the center is dominating in the Democratic Party. And the reason I remain a Democrat is I want to keep it that way. Um, today, um, the presidential uh, nominee of the Democrats, who likely will be the president, selected Ron Klain to be his chief of staff. I, I know Ron. I remember him when he was a student. Um, he is center left, uh, not hard left. Uh, he represents the kind of Biden approach to the Democratic Party. And so my goal is to keep the Democratic Party centrist, to make support for Israel bipartisan, to marginalize the extreme left of the Democratic Party. One of the interesting issues will be whether or not um, Biden, when he becomes president, will throw a bone to the hard left and appoint somebody like Bernie Sanders as labor secretary. I don't think he can do a lot of harm as labor secretary, but that may happen. He might also throw a bone to uh, one Republican Trump supporter and perhaps appoint that person uh, to the cabinet to show that he means it when he says he's the president of all the people. Keep an open mind, keep your eyes open, keep your critical senses operating, and let's wait and see if the Democratic Party deserves our support. I wouldn't hesitate to leave the Democratic Party if it became the party of the hard left, but I want to try to stop it from happening. And so I'm remaining a Democrat, though I'll vote for candidates from either party if I think the candidate is the best candidate for America and for the world. Harvey from Henderson, what's your point? What respectable law firm would turn down fees to try and prove that which cannot be proven? It's ridiculous. I would take the money and fail to prove what they claim never happened. Well, law firms are businesses, and they take cases uh, based on business considerations. When I agreed to oppose President Trump's impeachment in front of the United States Senate, 
I decided I would not uh, keep uh, the legal fee. I donated it to uh, charity uh, because I do half of my cases pro bono, and I wanted that case. I wanted to be representing the Constitution. I wanted to be representing the presidency, and so I made my own decision. But law firms are entitled to charge, and they do, and um, they're entitled to make business decisions. I hope they're all moral decisions, but uh, making arguments that are unlikely to succeed is part of what lawyers do. So um, I have no criticism of the law firms that are trying to exhaust all legal remedies on behalf of their client, uh, President Trump, though I don't think they're going to succeed in the end. Our next call is from California. Chris? Question, if uh, with the Biden presidency, if he were to face impeachment for supposed corruption uh, involved in Ukraine, would you support it and would you defend him in a potential Senate trial if he asked you? I would absolutely defend um, a President Biden or a President Hillary Clinton as I did President Bill Clinton. Um, I think impeachment should be reserved only for the most extreme cases. It has to fit the constitutional criteria of treason, bribery, other high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, generalized statements about corruption are, are not enough. So yes, I would proudly defend uh, a President Biden if he were impeached. And some of the people who now hate me would love me and some of the people who now love me would hate me. That's the nature of being a defense lawyer and a constitutional lawyer. Our next question is from Texas. I have a comment and a question today. I was really upset about the election result. However, on introspection, I believe the 72 million people who voted for President Trump will have a long memory. It's almost better had Vice President Biden won in a landslide. But the way he won draws aspersions and doubts. And, and to 71, 72 million people, they'll be waiting for two more years. I foresee the House to flip. And then at that point, the Senate and the House will be under Republican control. And a weak president will not be able to do much of anything. Also, I believe if he plays his cards well, President Trump will go down as a tragic hero. And tragic heroes live long beyond their lifespan. And more importantly, he can be a kingmaker in 2024. My question is this. I'm really surprised why a country like the U.S. doesn't have a central election commission that organizes and conducts elections and counts the votes. Even third world countries have a central election commission that is apolitical. Why is this? It's a great question. I agree with you. I think it would be much better if uh, presidential elections were national and we had a national election commission comprised of former justices of the Supreme Court, former judges, deans of law schools, uh, professors, uh, prominent business people, nonpartisans, people of all parties and no parties, that would be f much better, unfortunately, for better or worse, we have a constitution. And the constitution makes every presidential election into 50 state elections. And it's conceivable Congress could pass a statute setting up a commission to kind of oversee state elections for president. But in the end, most of the important decisions under the constitution would have to be made by the state legislatures. That's what Article II mandates. And so we're stuck with it. Uh, the Constitution has some great provisions and some not so great provisions, and you take it or leave it. One of the provisions in the Constitution is a difficult path toward amending it. We've amended it very, very few times, and unlikely will amend it to change the nature of presidential elections. I invited callers to give me their opinion as to what somebody like me, a liberal Democrat who was also a strong supporter of Israel, what position we should take with a candidate, the Reverend Warnock, who's running for the Senate as a Democrat in uh, Georgia, who has expressed virulently strong and inappropriate and mendacious views on uh, Israel. And, um, and I've invited him on the show to discuss with me whether he's changed his mind. He says he has, but I have some hard questions for him. And so I asked for your advice, and um, I'm waiting to hear what you have to say on The Dirt Show. Our first caller is Abe in North Carolina. 
I heard your uh, discussion today about a uh, uh, candidate for the Senate from Georgia, Rafael Barnock. Uh, Professor Dershowitz, I'm sorry to say, but I think the problem is not one uh, Senate candidate. It's all over the Democratic Party. Listen to the squad. Listen to that candidate from Georgia. Listen to number three in the congressional delegation, the whip, Sen uh, Representative Kleiber, who said, who cares about the Holocaust? It happened such a long time ago. We had a problem with a president who was essentially anti-Israel, President Obama. I, I assume you voted for him, but regardless of that, they all know to say the nice things before the election to get the vote and m probably more important to get the money. Once they get elected, forget it. You make an interesting point. Uh, we've had anti-Israel presidents before. Uh, Eisenhower was one. Um, George H.W. Bush was another. Uh, Obama was pro-Israel in terms of military support and anti-Israel in terms of the Iran deal and some of the other issues, complicated, difficult. Uh, I voted for him twice. I have thought hard about whether my second vote was justified. I had met with him in the Oval Office. He had promised me that he had Israel's back. I didn't realize that what he meant was he had Israel's back to put a target on it, uh, which is what he did as he was leaving office with the UN Security Council resolution that declared the Western Wall, Israel's holiest site, to be illegally occupied territory. An outrageous, outrageous position taken by the Obama administration. Uh, for which I condemned him and really ended my relationship with him, which went back to his time in law school. Um, both, there are both Democrats and Republicans who are anti-Israel. There are more Democrats who are anti-Israel. The squad clearly is anti-Israel. And I think the senator uh, who's running, uh, the person who's running for the Senate from Georgia, uh, Warnick, has expressed anti-Israel views. I have an open mind as to whether he has truly and genuinely changed his mind and I welcome him on this show to persuade me and persuade my viewers and listeners that he has indeed uh, changed his view. So let's hear if he accepts uh, my invitation. Our next caller is Gil. What's your point, Gil? Uh, Mr. Dershowitz, I was giving you a call in regard to your question about the Georgia Senate race uh, with Mr. Warnock. Um, while I think uh, he's done a lot of positive things for religious, uh, his religious movement um, and, and the voters of Georgia, I think it's important to, to take a look at this in, in the bigger kind of rubric of the BDS movement, uh, which I think is, you know, definitely gaining popularity with, uh, you know, the so-called far left Democratic Party. I think we've had first positive steps with the, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, recognizing um, normalizing relations with Israel. So I think it, it, it's a terrible idea to possibly give Senate control to a party that wants to possibly uh, make that one of their initiatives. Um, I, I don't like that. I don't like that trend, especially with uh, just the, the good trend in that region. Uh, first time we've seen, uh, you know, an agreement in, in you know, uh, the last 15 years. You make a good point. Uh, I certainly would like to see whoever is president continue the movement toward normalization of relations between Israel and Arab Sunni countries. I would hope that uh, President Trump uh, in the next couple of months uh, will move in that direction and try to get Saudi Arabia and other states to uh, normalize relationships with uh, Israel. And whoever the next president is, likely Joe Biden, I hope he will build on those relationships and try to increase the number of Arab countries that recognize um, Israel and normalize relationships to it. Uh, I would hate to see the good, positive work done by the Trump administration ignored by his successor. So let's hope that uh, whoever is president builds on the accomplishments of the Trump administration in the Middle East, and they are great accomplishments. Our next call is from Stephanie in North Carolina. I have heard that the Biden transition team has already been in touch with foreign leaders, even though he is not yet uh, President-elect Biden. Seems to me there was kind of a little stir about named uh, 
National Security Advisor for President Trump, General Flynn, speaking to a Russian diplomat during the interim period <clears throat> following the 2016 election, a subject that four years later is still under discussion. Uh, my question is, what is the actual legal protocol for the timeline of an incoming team to do so without being investigated by U.S. intelligence? Oh, and as for your moral conundrum in Georgia's upcoming runoff election, the choice is indeed difficult. You'll have to decide whether to throw Israel under the bus in favor of a possibly outdated relationship to a particular party, not to your principles, but to the party that might no longer represent you as it once did. Believe me, it's not easy. I agree with you. It's, uh, it's, it's not easy. And for me, it is a matter of principle. As to your first question, we have this ridiculous law in the books called the Logan Act, which says uh, that no person who's a private citizen can really negotiate with foreign powers purportedly on behalf of the United States. It grew out of the, uh, an early experience under President Washington uh, with negotiations with France. But it's anachronistic, outdated, hasn't been used for um, over 200 years. Uh, but it's always there as a threat. Um, partisans uh, against President Trump tried to invoke the Logan Act uh, against uh, Flynn and against others. It's absurd. Uh, any American should have the right to have discussions with foreign leaders. Certainly, if you're a candidate for president, you should be able to do that. Ronald Reagan did it. Um, it was done by other presidents uh, and presidential candidates before they became president. So. Um, I, I welcome um, Biden's team uh, having discussions with foreign leaders. Most of them are simply in the form of congratulatory messages. But even if they were substantive, that's OK, as long as they don't try to interfere with foreign policy. The only president, in my knowledge, who's ever tried to interfere with foreign policy, and I think it was absolutely despicable, was uh, Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter tried to persuade Yasser Arafat and successfully persuaded Yasser Arafat not to accept the peace uh, offer that the Israelis and, and President Clinton made uh, to the Palestinians back in 2000, 2001. Uh, Jimmy Carter had a close personal relationship with Yasser Arafat. Jimmy Carter never met a Palestinian terrorist he didn't like, and he never met an Israeli peacemaker that he did like. Uh, Jimmy Carter's views on, on the Middle East and Israel were abominable. And he clearly violated the Logan Act, not only violated the Logan Act, but did a terrible, terrible thing by urging uh, Arafat uh, not to accept a peace offer, which could have resulted in a Palestinian state 20 years ago. So shame, shame on President Carter. I wish I had never voted for him. Uh, he actually apparently considered me for some judicial positions um, uh, he liked me, apparently, early on in his presidency, but once the Israel thing came out, I think neither of us likes each other, and I think what he did in, in 2000, 2001 is absolutely beneath contempt. The next call is from New Jersey. What's your point? While I approve of your condemnation and refusal to contribute any money to Raphael Warnock, I think you are wrong in your condemnation of lawyers who do not want their law firms to act on behalf of President Trump. I agree, normally, people deserve to have a lawyer defend them, but this is a totally different situation. Everybody I have heard says Mr. Trump has the right to bring legal challenges, but he is not just bringing legal challenges. He is saying that the election was stolen. He says there's massive fraud. Which he has, for which he has brought zero proof, and he is refusing to cooperate with a normal transition in the case that Biden ends up winning the election. He is acting like a spoiled child. A sore loser is an understatement, and the, he should not be encouraged in this behavior. And everybody knows, including all the Republican senators, that he has lost the election. Let him say, let's go forward with planning for the transition, I, while I bring my legal challenges, and we'll see what happens. But he is not doing that. He is egging his, his supporters on. He's raising money and uh, in order to retire his campaign debt based on this issue. And he is just telling people the election was stolen, which is just false. 
You make an interesting point, um, but how do you know that his lawyers aren't encouraging him to do exactly what you say he should do? Lawyers do that. When lawyers take cases, they not only advocate for their clients, but they advise their clients. I've had clients who have said to me, I want you to appeal my conviction because the conviction was corrupt. It was the result of bribery as a result of this. And I, I don't believe that it was corrupt or the result of bribery. And I'm not going to argue that in my appeal, uh, but I won't reject the case because my clients have expressed views that I don't necessarily agree with. I would try to advise my client not to express those views because I think it would hurt him uh, in the court. But there's a big difference between your criticism of President Trump, which I fully understand, and your criticism of lawyers who are willing to defend President Trump, which I respectfully disagree with. But thanks for your call. Our next call is from New York, Sandra. And I am calling to speak about the races in Georgia. Um, you asked who to vote for. Um, I, I wish I knew. I wish I knew how to say this better, but I cannot vote for someone who who selects Israel from all the nations on earth for opprobrium, uh, ignoring nations that uh, uh, mutilate women, uh, who um, sell children into sex slavery, uh, who uh, occupy other nations and annex them with the United Nations looking the other way. Uh, with all the nations on earth, many of which can be selected for criticism, only Israel is chosen here. That smells of anti-Semitism. Uh, for uh, for uh, all of written history, Jews have been persecuted about once every 80 to 100 years throughout history. I don't want it to continue. I cannot vote for somebody who selects Israel for criticism when it's, um, it's a precious nation. It's a democracy. It is a friend of the United States. And it's also a place to go if you are in danger of persecution. So my question is, how do we support the opposition? I, I don't know how to do that, and I would like to know how to do that. It's a very good point. I agree with you. I think that I could never vote for anybody who singles out Israel for opprobrium and criticism and who engages in lies. I mean, for example, one of the things that um, uh, Reverend Warnock said in a sermon, not just a statement he signed, but in a sermon, he accused Israel of shooting down innocent Palestinian children like birds of prey. That's a blood libel. It's totally false. Um, his defenders cite a United Nations investigation. Duh, United Nations, we know. They condemn Israel more than all the rest of the countries of the world combined and to cite a United Nations investigation in support of a lie told by the Reverend Warnock doesn't really persuade any objective or reasonable uh, person. Now, Warnock has said that he does not support BDS. The statement that he signed seems to support BDS. It talks sympathetically about economic pressures being put on Israel. But he's now said he doesn't support BDS, and he thinks BDS is anti-Semitic. I want to hear the rest of his views. I want to hear them, and I want to determine whether I believe them. I don't really care what's in his heart. I care how he will vote and what he will say if he was elected to the United States Senate. His opponent is a woman named Loeffler. I don't really know her. She uh, owns or used to own, I'm not sure, a WNBA uh, basketball team. Uh, I'm not urging people to vote for her. I don't take a position on that. I am urging people to raise hard questions about Warnick and not to support Warnick unless he has persuaded you and me and others that he's changed his outrageous and bigoted views relating to Israel. An important part of The Der Show is your voice, your questions, your comments. Please call 24-7. The number is 216 710 0050. Keep your comments short and to the point. Again, the number for you to call 24 7 is 216 710 0050. Hard questions, criticisms, everything's fine. Just keep your questions short and I'll answer them all on the Dirt Show.